All right, today we are talking about murder. Now, why are we talking about murder? Well, because we are in the series of the Ten Commandments. In fact, this is one of the Ten Commandments. It is the Fifth Commandment, which simply reads this. It says, you shall not murder. You shall not murder. Now, whenever I do this, just about every year, I ask the kids, hey, what's the Fifth Commandment? And there's always one kid, I swear, that says, oh, the Fifth Commandment is do not kill. And that's wrong. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says do not murder. What's the difference between killing and murder? Well, the short definition for murder is killing an innocent life. Killing an innocent life. Killing an innocent human life. And so, because of that, then we have to look at all of this is reframed. It's not just about killing, but it's about killing an innocent life. And I got to tell you that when we talk about this area of murder, this is actually something that is culturally just widely misunderstood. Um, people have their own definitions of, of what they think to be uh, wrong or what they think to be murder. But actually, you know what? The Bible says something different than what a lot of other people out there think and say. So you're going to go through your life and you're going to hear people say, the, oh, this is wrong or this is right. And actually, their standard is just simply their own feelings or maybe someone else's opinion. But you know what? If we're going to look at what God says about murder, we're going to look at his word. We're going to look at the Bible because that is the most reliable way that God reveals himself to us is through the Bible. So so let's get into a few things here. Uh, the first one here is this commandment is not about prohibiting killing animals. Uh, this is not about prohibiting killing animals. So in other words, it is okay to kill an animal, especially if you're going to use that animal for food. Now we see this because again, let's look in the Bible for what God has to say about this. And we find this in Genesis chapter nine. God says this, this is right after the flood, Noah's ark, and he's telling Noah and his sons, here's what you are to do. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. So if you eat chicken or turkey or beef or pork or whatever, that's not a sin. In fact, um, one thing that we find is, is right here in the Bible, God is actually giving permission. He is giving um, animals for humans as food, as a means of protein, as a means of sustenance. Now, it does not mean that you have to eat animals. In fact, um, if you are vegetarian or especially if you're a vegan, then hey, good for you. That means that you actually have a really good healthy diet. That means you're going to be really strong and healthy and you're going to live many, many years Unlike, well, people such as myself who does not exactly have the best diet. So congratulations. If you're a vegetarian or vegan, that means that you could actually live a pretty darn healthy life. Um, and you can choose to do that. And you can just choose, hey, you know what? Either um, you don't like to see animals being slaughtered for food, or maybe it just doesn't appeal to you, or you'd rather eat vegetables. All of that is completely fine, but you cannot make a theological statement here to say that um, if we were to, let's say, um, you know, raise a cow and then we were to consume the cow for food, you cannot make a biblical basis that that is wrong or that that's murder. All right. Now, all that being said, though, um, how you slaughter the cow actually does make a little bit of a difference, all right? So if you're going to slaughter the cow, it needs to be done in a way where you're not torturing the animal or something of that nature. But if you are slaughtering the animal in a um, humane way as much as possible, and then you're using that for food and you're not just wasting it, there's biblical basis for that. All right, so so just as killing animals is not prohibited in scripture, um, this commandment is also not prohibiting the death penalty. 
And so what we're talking about here with the death penalty, this is whenever someone commits a crime. And it's not just any crime, but rather it is, uh, especially in Arizona where we still have the death penalty, or um, in other states such as Texas where I'm from, that in, in these laws you have to commit a really, really, really serious crime. So not only murder, but, but like serial murder, meaning multiple, multiple deaths. And you have to also do it in a way that is just uh, torturous and just really Really, really awful, just a very heinous crime. We actually do in Arizona and also my backyard in Texas still allow the death penalty. And that's okay because if, if someone commits a really heinous crime and then they receive the death penalty as punishment, that's not murdering the person. It is killing the person, but it is not murder because again, remember, what is the definition of murder? Murder is killing an innocent life killing an innocent human life to clarify the first point here. But here's the thing is that some people look at the death penalty and say, I don't get it. The fifth commandment says, do not murder. Well, if a person commits a really awful crime, such as murder, especially serial murder, then they are not innocent. And so God actually, and some people don't even know this, but in the Old Testament where God creates the civil laws, now we don't have those today. We, we just simply have the civil laws of the United States of America in Arizona because there is no longer the holy nation of Israel. But for a while there in the Old Testament, God actually established the holy nation of Israel and he created the legal and the justice system back then. And so it was not up to, to kings or to whoever to create the legal or justice system. No, that was God ordained. God gave them the laws and how they are to enact civil justice and punishment. And when God created the laws, he actually created the death penalty as well. That if, if you um, committed murder, then guess what? You received the death penalty. This was often in the form of stoning, where people then would pick up rocks and you would immediately be stoned to death. Now there was a trial, and as well, there had to be two or more witnesses, but if you were convicted, you received the death penalty. Also, it wasn't just murder. Now that is kind of the case here in Arizona, but it would also be for things such as adultery. It would be for things such as incest. Oh, I don't know, how about disobeying your parents? That was actually a commandment here. And if you broke that commandment, now you probably had to do it in a pretty public way, but you could receive the death penalty. Now imagine if the death penalty was given for disobeying parents in this day and age. Could you imagine? There would be no children left, right? But, but I, my point here is this is that when God creates his legal system and his justice system, which includes punishment for crime, he includes the death penalty. In fact, let's look here um, at a couple of these here. So this is from Leviticus 24. It says, anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. Also, we have this from the book of Romans. It says, for one, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So what Romans here is saying, just to give a little bit of a context here, is saying that God actually uses the government and he uses legal system, even though it may not be exactly his legal system that he had in the Old Testament, he still uses governments um, in the New Testament and in, in our era as well to punish wrongdoers. And, and it's a way of um, curbing people's behavior so that way they don't go and commit these crimes. It's a way of, of covering their behavior and as well for punishing those who do. So, and God uses the legal system in that way. So, Second point here is that this, when we talk about murder, it is not murder to punish someone with the death penalty. And we get that from the Bible. So the third point here is that it is not prohibiting going to war. It is not prohibiting going to war. So here's the deal from a Christian biblical standpoint here. War is, is really only a necessary thing to do as a last resort. Here's, here's what I mean. So if you're someone, if you're a country, and let's say you're in charge of a country, and let's say that there's an enemy nation out there, and this enemy nation is doing something that's really, really wrong and really, really evil. So let's say they're just conquering uh, other 
um, nations around them, other countries. They're enslaving people. They're um, they're just they're they're spreading, and and they're also spreading their evil throughout a land. Now, as as a, another nation, we would look at that and we'd say we need to stop them from from committing this this evil and passing this along. And so what you do is you start with diplomacy. So you start with, hey, um, there needs to be negotiations, there needs to be some sort of talking, some sort of strategy to see if it could be stopped just through negotiations. But the problem is there are some people out there who are just so evil, and there are some nations who just do such evil things that Talking just doesn't work. You can talk, talk, talk all day long, and they're going to still keep doing their thing. And so sometimes war is necessary. It's never the first, re the first reaction, or it should never be the first reaction from a biblical standpoint. But the deal is that sometimes it's necessary to engage in warfare. Um, especially if, if they attack you and you need to now defend yourself and you need to then attack them back to be able to, to prevent them from uh, attacking you again in the future. And so, so here's what I mean. So let's take, let's take uh, um, World War II, for example. So, in fact, there was actually a policy by the United States and by other countries that was called appeasement. They looked at Adolf Hitler and said, yeah, the guy's really evil. He's doing really evil things. But you know what? Let's just, let's just appease him. If we can just give him a little bit, then he's going to be satisfied with what we give him. And so really, they just allowed him to take over all of Europe. And was he satisfied whenever he took over all of Europe? No, he wanted to keep going. He wanted them to go in and attack Russia. He was going to take over the entire world unless we engaged in warfare. That was the only way of stopping someone like Hitler. Now, also, we can take something like 9-11. And so with 9-11, what we have here is we have a group of terrorists who then attacked the United States. And, and then as well, um, we reacted by engaging in warfare to protect ourselves and to squish out these terrorist groups so that they do not attack us again. So it's a means now of self-defense. So here's the deal. If you are a soldier and you are attacking another soldier, from the opposing or from the enemy nation, or in this case, terrorist group, then yes, you are killing them, but you are not murdering them. So because they are not innocent, because they are a soldier that is um, pledging their allegiance to their nation or to their, to their group. Now, in warfare, can you commit murder? Absolutely. If you, um, rather than, let's say you go into a village, and let's just say that here is the barracks of the soldiers, and you were to go in and you were to, to attack the soldiers, that's not murder. But let's say you turned yourself around, and now here's civilians, and women and children especially, who are defenseless, and, and well, they're not engaged in any sort of army or warfare, and you were to go in and kill them, would that be murder? The answer is Yes. And so, um, in fact, you know, we call this a war crime or sometimes as well called a crime against humanity. And, and, and there is a ton of uh, rules. And, and unfortunately, I kind of gave some very black and white, clean cut examples here. And unfortunately, in warfare, sometimes it's not always so clean cut. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a gray area, um, but that's what our military is trained to do. And as well, that's why we have things like the UN and the Geneva Convention, and they decide all these things and they kind of set them up just so that way it's a little bit clearer. Um, but what I'm saying is this, is that if you engage in warfare from a biblical standpoint, it's not murder because sometimes it's just necessary to, to, to go into warfare to either stop the spread of evil or for self-defense. Um, and as well, there's tons of Old Testament examples of this. Again, when God created the holy nation of Israel, um, the holy nation of, of Israel engaged in warfare, oftentimes because, say, an enemy nation was coming in to attack them and they would run them out. Um, and, and so we actually do see warfare in the Old Testament, and it's never condemned by God as a, oh, just because you defended yourself as a nation does not mean that it's murder, all right? So, since it is not about uh, killing animals, 
It's not about the death penalty or about warfare. It is, however, about a few other things that we're going to talk about. Obviously, yes, it applies to um, just, say, taking a gun and shooting and killing someone who's innocent. It absolutely applies to that. And most people understand that in our culture. So I'm not really going to belabor that point. However, I'm going to give you three things that are a little bit controversial and as well um, that are widely misunderstood in our culture. So let's get right into the heavy ones. Are you guys ready? Because it's I'm going to drop a bomb on you guys. Here we go. Whew, here we go. So the first one here is that God says no to suicide. God says no to suicide. So suicide, and some people, even psychologists and others, even call this self-murder because that's exactly what it is. And in fact, what the Bible says about suicide is this. God says in Jeremiah, he says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. One of the things that we find in the Bible is that the very first verse says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he talks about how, um, how God has, is infinite. God has always lived. The Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, have always lived as far as infinite time can ever go back. But then he decided to create humanity. And he decided to create you. God actually knew way in advance from the foundations before the earth was created that he was going to create you. And he has a plan for you. Did you know that? Some people don't know that. Some people go through their life thinking that they're just living a meaningless life and there really is no purpose to any of this and they're just kind of floating through life. Well, guess what? God absolutely has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. He, he, knows, he knows your name. He knows, the Bible even says, he knows how many hairs you have on your head. How insane is that? To actually, I, I don't even know how many hairs I have. The only people who really know that are bald people because they just know they have no hair on their head. But God does. So here's my point. God has a plan for you. He has a purpose. And he, he wants to use you as an instrument to fulfill his great plan that he has. And so the problem with suicide is that someone looks at God and they say, God, I don't believe that you have a plan for me. I don't trust you. I don't trust your ways. I don't trust your plans. And instead, I am going to take my life. And what is that? That's a lack of faith. That is looking at God with, with disbelief in God and his plans. And so, here's the thing with suicide is that, that someone can become really depressed. And whenever I say depressed, I'm talking like clinical depression here. Now, clinical depression here is not just simply um, what we call the baby blues, meaning you're just a little down. And we all get like that. Our, we have emotions. We experience sometimes we're up a little bit. Sometimes we're down just a little bit. But clinical depression is a little bit different. It's not just being a little sad. Clinical depression is really a downward spiral. And so I just want to say this. I want to say that, that, that if, if you are feeling like you are depressed, then here's the thing what you need to do. You need to seek help. You absolutely do. You need to come talk to me, come to our pastors here at our church, come to your parents. I know, I know. And, and your parents, you, you may not think to yourself, you can't talk to your parents. Oh, absolutely you can. Your parents would love nothing more than to be able to sit down with you and to be able to talk about this and to give you the help that you need. Uh, believe me, there are tons of counselors out there, Christian counselors who would love to sit down and to be able to talk through why are you feeling depressed? Why are you feeling sad? What is going on in your life? To be able to work through these things, to help be able to manage them, to be able to help get you back on track in life. And so I just want to say that if you feel like you're going through depression or maybe you have a friend who's going through depression, you they need to seek help and you need to help them get help because oftentimes, sometimes people who are depressed um, don't really have the initiative to do it on their own. And sometimes they need a friend to come alongside them. And so here's the deal with depression is absolutely seek help. So, so if we go back to our verse here, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so ultimately, 
what, what the Christian life is, is looking at God saying, God, I believe in you and I have hope in you. And one of the problems with suicide, because suicide is a rejection of God and a rejection of his plans here, that then ultimately it's a lack of faith. And, and so that's why in, in the Bible, whenever um, we talk about this issue of suicide, there really isn't a promise, there really isn't a lot of hope that a person ends up in heaven as a result. Now, it may be possible, um, but, but ultimately there's not really a lot of evidence that if the last thing that you say to yourself and to God is, is that, God, I, I don't trust that you have plans for me, and I don't believe that there's any hope in my life. And ultimately, that's a really dark place. And I, and I strongly believe that Satan is, is standing right there next to a person and is talking in their ear and tempting them and, and um, swaying them to, to then uh, take their life and to commit suicide. And so that's why I mentioned this, because this is a really, really big deal. Uh, one thing that I hear is that uh, I hear that someone committed suicide and people would say, well, they're in a better place. And I would say, well, what's the biblical evidence that they are? Um, and, in fact, there's even a student who I counseled and, and he was struggling with this. And, um, and he actually told me, he, he said that, he said, you know, Mike, uh, one of the, the reasons that I'm still alive today is because, because I think if I were to commit suicide, then maybe I'll end up in hell. And, and, and I don't want to compromise my eternity because it's forever. <laughs> I mean, to think about that like that, the, the, the deal with depression, the deal with this earth is it's all short term. It's all temporary. Whatever you're going through right now is temporary, will not last for forever. However, wherever we end up, eternal life, eternal death, heaven or hell, is for forever. And so he just thought about it. And you know what? Praise be to God that God got hold of him to at least have that kind of perspective. And in fact, he's still living today. In fact, he has been able to work through a lot of things and get to the other side of a lot of things. Now, all that being said, I will say that I talked to someone one time and, and she told me that she took a big bottle of Advil and she had um, uh, ate the entire bottle, uh, however many dozens or maybe even hundreds of pills that she took here, and it was an attempt at suicide. Um, but for her though, as she kind of noticed that she was getting drowsier and drowsier, she kind of was, was kind of feeling a little bit out of it. And, and at this point, all she was doing was she was praying to God in repentance, saying, God, I'm really sorry, I want to live. And she tried to um, induce vomit to, uh, to get the pills out of her. And, and for her, she ended up going to sleep, and praise be to God that she woke up. And, and, and so for, for someone like that, it is possible then that, yeah, she could have absolutely ended up in heaven because she, her last moment, she's having so much faith in Jesus and God and repentant and being sorry. But whenever you have someone who's not, there's just not a lot of hope in the Bible. And so that's why I talk about it, uh, not just because um, to, to scare anyone or something like that, but, but just to talk about the reality. This is real stuff, guys. And this kind of stuff matters for all of eternity. So... God says no to suicide. The second one's pretty similar to it, um, but we're going to be talking about assisted suicide. Assisted suicide. And so, so the difference here for this one is that, so when we talk about suicide, usually people are talking about uh, things that are going to actively take their life. And so we're talking about, um, you know, ways of immediately sh uh, uh, killing themselves, uh, murdering themselves. But with assisted suicide, this has actually kind of come up now as a thing in the medical community where uh, people, let's say that you're in a lot of pain and, and let's say that you um, have some sort of illness or condition where you're suffering, people then would go to a doctor and in some states this is actually legal legal, not illegal, but legal, that you can go to a, a doctor and a doctor can rec rec recommend you or prescribe for you a suicide pill. And then you just simply take the pill. And a lot of people look at that and say, oh, well, that's not suicide because, well, they were in pain, but now they're in a better place. Again, going back to our first point here, are you sure? But, but, but also here is, is it's just this thought that, that, um, 
that we're talking, it's, it's, it's very much in the same vein as, as suicide. It just simply sounds better because, well, it's prescribed by a doctor and there's not laws that, that say that it's, that it's wrong or that it's murder. But guess what? God would still look at that absolutely and say it's absolutely still murder. And so, so whenever we look at this, we just have to look at this as well. Um, especially when we talk about this area of depression or if you're in pain, let's look at this verse right here from Psalm 55. It says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. And so if you are in pain, give that to God. Now, what I just mentioned here was kind of a black and white example about if you're in pain and then you get, let's say, a cyanide pill and then you take the cyanide pill and you die. In fact, um, this actually does happen though, okay? In fact, there was a big thing in social media uh, very recently here where this lady had uh, migraines and so she went to a doctor and she got a cyanide pill and so she made a party about it. She had uh, people showed up to this event and they're all celebrating, they're all giving each other high fives. They even put it on Facebook. Facebook Live and YouTube Live, and she ends up taking the pill, and then she ends up uh, committing suicide right there, and everyone's celebrating it as if it's some sort of positive or good thing, which is absolutely insane for, for me to even comprehend. So that absolutely does happen. But also, let's talk just for a second um, a what if situation, because again, all of this has a whole bunch of different situations around it. So. So the cyanide pill is one thing, but let's say that you have, oh, I don't know, let's say you have your grandma and she's in the hospital and let's just say that uh, she's, she uh, got hit by a, a bus on the way home, okay, and uh, she's now in what they call a persistent vegetative state, meaning that she's in a coma and she's not able to move. Uh, she may be able to hear you, but we don't know. Uh, she's just completely still and she's in a vegetative state. But she, um, to keep her alive, there's a machine, a breathing machine that keeps her alive. Uh, now, if you were to unplug the machine, then she would die. And so it is this question, is that suicide if you pull the plug, so to speak? And, and it's a little bit different because say a cyanide pill or, or any other form of suicide would be um, an active way. And this is certainly passive because she's not, she's not taking a cyanide pill to kill herself. She is allowing whatever illness or condition that she's in to do its work. So she's not actively doing anything that she's passively allowing it to happen. So that's absolutely a big difference. But the biggest difference here for me is this, and this is what can help make this easier to understand, is, is the person a believer in Jesus? Is the person a Christian? If the answer is yes, they are a believer in Jesus, then guess what? I would pull the plug because, and, and not do anything to actively kill them, but just allow whatever condition they have to kill them. Um, because if they are a believer in Jesus, then they are going home with Jesus and they are going to spend eternity in heaven and I'm going to see them later. Now, if that person, however, is not a believer in Jesus, then why would I do anything passive or active or otherwise to allow that person to then go to hell? And so if that person is in a vegetative state, I am certainly not pulling any plug. I'm keeping that plug in the wall. And in fact, I'm going to be by their bedside and I'm going to be preaching Jesus, hoping that they can hear me. If they can hear me, then maybe they can repent of their sins. Maybe they can believe in Jesus. And then maybe we'll have a shot that we can see them in heaven. And so that's the difference right there. Are they a believer or not? Um, okay, so now let's move on to our third point here. Our third point here is that God says no to abortion. To abortion. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, so, and we're going to be talking a lot about this in our, our next lesson here when we're talking about um, dating and we're talking about God's plan for marriage and for sexuality. But here's, here's the thing is that um, whenever, whenever women get pregnant, um, and, and it's, and it's unplanned. And so this could be, um, maybe outside of marriage or it could even be inside of marriage and people have abortions 
as married couples all the time, which is really tragic. But but let's just say, you know, for the sake of argument, that um, that that someone it's it's unplanned. They weren't expecting uh, the baby. Now now they were in in many cases choosing to to have sex, and because of that, one of the um, results of sex is pregnancy. That is uh, at least a possibility. And so if someone were to get pregnant, then uh, oftentimes people uh, feel feel ashamed or they, they now think, oh my gosh, my life's gonna be completely different having a baby, which by the way, it will um, at any stage of life. I, I'll never forget um, whenever we got our first baby and and uh, well, we have four now, and, and, and even by our fourth one, uh, we're staying up all night, and the baby's screaming in my face and, and coughing and throwing up on me. I, I'm just going to say, like, look, as much as kids are absolutely a blessing, they're a lot of work as well, all right? And so a lot of people freak out whenever they get pregnant, especially if they weren't expecting it. And, and as a result, we, we have this thing in our culture that's actually legal. So again, it's not illegal, it is legal. You can do this legally, is that people can go and uh, get an operation called an abortion. An abortion is, is whenever the baby is inside the mother's womb. Uh, there's two different methods, uh, at least the, that I'm aware of. Uh, one is, is basically if the baby is young enough, then they'll use a, a vacuum hose to be able to go into the womb and then to suck up and then to murder the baby in that way. And then the other way is to be able to go in with uh, some sort of utensils if the baby is too big to fit inside of the hose um, and then to essentially pull the baby out limb by limb. Now, what I'm saying about all this is that it, it's, even though that it's legal to do this, to, to, to murder an unborn baby in the womb, it is legal currently. Now, hopefully by the time that we're, we're watching this on YouTube, maybe some of our laws would have changed. That would be awesome. But for now, at the time of recording, it's legal. But here is the problem. Even though that it's legal by our laws, we also have to look at God's laws. And what does God have to say about this? Well, remember, murder is killing an innocent life. And the baby, whether the baby is inside the womb or outside the womb, the baby is still a baby. And as a result is an innocent life. So it is killing an innocent life. It is murder. Um, a couple really uh, quick things on this is that when I presented this live, we did have a question. Someone said, yeah, but it's not a baby yet. It's just a clump of cells. It's just a fetus, as she called it, um, because it's inside the womb. It's not outside the womb. And, and really, we have to look at the science behind all this. And we see that life begins at conception. Life begins at conception. And what happens is the baby inside the womb then grows and grows and grows and grows and grows and eventually leaves the womb. But life begins at conception. There is no marker where uh, it goes from not a baby to a baby. It is always a baby at conception. That's when life begins. In fact, um, this was legalized in America in the 1970s with this uh, Supreme Court case called Roe v. Wade, Roe versus Wade. And with this lawsuit and this uh, Supreme Court case that they had to hear and they eventually had to rule on, at the time in the 1970s, they did not have all the medical technology that they do today. And so it was kind of a thought, well, what does a baby even really look like inside the womb? And they didn't know because they didn't really have ultrasound. But in the 1980s and then since then, we have something called ultrasound where you can actually um, put a, a device on the womb and you can see the heartbeat of a baby as early as say like five weeks, I think. Uh, I know certainly whenever we went in for, for our fourth child and, and we're, we're watching the heartbeat and then also we see the baby doing flips and, and they, all, they also gave us uh, something of a 4D printout. I mean, we're, we're the, it's a lifelike baby, just really, really kind of small, all right, in the womb. But we actually have a 4D graph of what our baby looks like at that moment. And just how amazing is that technology? And even so, with that hardness of heart, that the people then would look at this baby and say, oh, well, you know what, this baby uh, deserves to die just because it's not convenient for me or something or something of that nature. But here's what God would say. So God would say that even inside the womb or especially inside the womb, he cares for us. Here's what Psalm 139 says. It said, for you formed my inward parts. 
you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Underline that, circle that. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So God intricately has knitted us together inside of our mother's womb. That's how, that's how intimately he is involved in, in creating you. And, and, and so, so for someone then to look at um, an unborn baby in the womb and to say that it's not a life, well, it absolutely is a life. It absolutely is a baby. Um, I will also say this just really quickly about abortion is that um, there is some people out there who, who look at abortion and say, okay, it is, um, it's kind of like a necessary evil. Yeah, uh, it's, it's wrong, but there are some times when it's necessary, which, which I, I disagree with. It's, it's a bad argument, but that's kind of been the mantra from our culture for many years since Roe v. Wade. However, there is a new movement and there's a few different names for it. Like one is the hashtag shout your abortion. Um, and, and really what they're doing here is they're actually celebrating abortion. They're actually saying, uh, not only is it a, oh, I guess we have to do it, darn, which is, which is wrong in and of itself. But, but now they're actually looking at it and they're saying, oh, it's a good thing. And women should have abortions and we should celebrate it. It's absolutely insane. In fact, there's uh, this woman who uh, recently was was at uh, the Golden Globes, and she had talked about how she uh, the reason why she's an actress is because when she was a teenager, uh, she had an abortion. There's politicians out there saying, uh, or there was this one talk show host out there saying that that she got fame and money and a nice office and a cool car and a cool talk show because she had an abortion. And since she wasn't bogged down by having children, she had multiple abortions, and now she gets to celebrate uh, the riches and, and the pleasures of life. And you just think to yourself, how, how evil is that statement? How depraved, how horribly wrong have we gone in our culture? When, when you look at money and stuff and a nice office, and you would say, I got here because I murdered my babies? Oh, that is just so wrong. It really is. Now, whenever we talk about this commandment for murder, you shall not murder. Again, what's the definition of murder? It's not just killing. It's killing an innocent life. And for the first point, killing an innocent human life. But here is the thing, is that when we talk about this area of murder, we also have to talk about God's forgiveness. And this is true for all the commandments. These commandments, remember, are written to prevent us from doing them, to also convict us whenever we have done these things that are wrong. And so, so as well, whenever we look at these sins, these are not unforgivable sins. So someone who has had an abortion, someone who has committed murder in some way, understand this, that there is such a thing as forgiveness. And in fact, especially in this area of warfare here, um, warfare can be very traumatizing for a lot of our troops that come back with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I even have a friend who went to war and, and well, he said that he just, he did horrible things over there. So, so some of them uh, may have just been killing soldiers, but some of them were a little bit gray area the way he described it. And, but either way, it was just very emotionally, very difficult on him. And he just felt like what he did was wrong, but he felt that God cannot forgive him of his sin. And so literally he's going on through life right now thinking that he has out God's grace. And as a result, he is just going to continue to live his life thinking that God um, is angry at him, that God will not forgive him. And he has cemented his own fate thinking that he is going to hell because that's what he deserves. And rather than going to God and saying, God, I'm sorry for what I did. And God, I, I'm asking you to forgive me. And then receiving that forgiveness, because God says that if we go to him in repentance, he will forgive us. The only unforgivable sin is rejection of the Holy Spirit. Meaning if you push God out of your life, but if you go to God and say, God, I have done all these wrong things, and they may be really, really wrong things. But if you go to God and say, God, I'm so sorry for them, forgive me, God promises to give his forgiveness. So I say all that uh, as we talk about this commandment of the fifth commandment, do not murder.